Good evening, sir. Good evening, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Welcome all to Legends of the 70s, where we take a trip down memory lane and revisit those halcyon days of the beautiful game. And if we find a tavern, we'll drop in and raise a glass or two, as my guest today, David Moss of Swindon, Luton and Tampa Bay, shares his memories with us. How are you, mate? You OK? Yeah, I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, looking forward to this. Absolutely. First of all, David, um, you were born in 1952 on the 18th of March. I want to know thanks, about... Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> yeah, the years <laughs> just fly by. It didn't seem five minutes till we were watching you on Match of the Day in that wonderful, iconic Luton Town kit, um, scoring all them goals and scoring goals at St Andrews as well, I have to say, as well as Anfield. Your goal oh, yes, record yes. was quite phenomenal. So we're going to get into that a little bit later in the podcast. But I want to know a little bit about your upbringing. You come into the world in 1950. 19- 52. Where did your football DNA come from? Your mother or your father? <laughs> Good question. My dad was a was a, a, like a non-league player. Low. Yeah, my dad obviously uh, he was in the navy at 16 in the war. So um, in those days, that's what it was like, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, but his he loved football. He took um, he started a junior team in Whitney, where we where we came from, Whitney Town. And basically, I played for anybody uh, who had a football team. I joined the boys' brigade because they had a football team. I, jo- I joined some church group, I think, because they had a football team on a Sunday morning and things like that. I was also, I've got the record for being the youngest player ever to play for my primary school. How old was you? I was seven and I played for the team in the, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously the team was um, 11 and under. Yeah. So I was very young, but I, I understand somebody did tell me that record still stands. Probably because they don't play football now. No, but that is very young. Because anybody that's played football and, and knows the age groups, we, in the old days we played under-11s, under-12s, now they play the small sidey games. But to yeah. play for the fourth years, really, when pretty much you were a first year, that is yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, it was good, good times because... Yeah. I can remember when we played, we played during school time, so maybe on a Wednesday afternoon and the whole school would be <clears throat> around the football pitch when we played another local Oxfordshire team. So yeah, it was lovely. I can remember it very clearly. And then progressing through the ranks, going to the senior school, uh, well, junior school, then senior school. Did you play for the, the, the district or the county? What was did, the yeah. next stage for you? Yeah, it was I went to a grammar school actually, which was a non-football grammar school. Right. It was a rugby school, but because of my football links, I was playing every Saturday and Sunday. I was selected for the Whitney and District team, and then consequently, it led to the playing for the county Oxfordshire schoolboys at sort of fourteen, fifteen. Um, and then and then I went. I was playing for Whitney Town when I was fourteen, which yeah. was a senior. It's in the Hellenic League. I don't know if you've heard of the Hellenic League. But no, it's a, it's a very good, strong league down south. Mm. Um, a physical league. And, and I was playing, first of all, I trained with them when I was 14. And I played for the first team when I was 15. Yeah. So I, so I did start very young in all, all the sort of teams and groups that I played for. I was the youngest player. Again, that's quite incredible for a young 14, 15-year-old kid to be playing adult football. How did that complement the district and, and your Sunday team, etc., and, and what have you, playing for men's sides? Um, it made it, I shouldn't say easy, but it made it yeah. slightly easier. Yeah. Because the, the obviously the men's football in those days was very physical. Mm. Um but I loved playing for the for the district and the and the county and we had some good players. Um, and it was good times, you know, but I, I can remember playing four times at a weekend, yeah. Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon for Whitney Town, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon for different teams. Um, so we didn't care then in those days about um, tiredness or anything like that. We were we were young and fit. 
So was you scouted up from the county games? Because, you know, when yeah. you're playing county games, there's scouts all over the place. And it was Swindon or Oxford that you could have gone to. You chose Swindon because they were your boyhood club, wasn't they? Yeah, yeah, that's where, even though we lived closer to Oxford, mm-hmm. uh, my dad used to take me to Swindon most weekends. Well, when we could, I went to all the midweek games and stuff. But if I wasn't playing, we would go to Swindon. Um, but I also, I was scouted by Tottenham when I was 14. Right. And, and actually signed schoolboy forms for them. Oh, OK. Um, but it didn't work out there. I went up there for a week uh, during the school holidays. Absolutely terrified me going up to London and yeah, did. Mm. staying up, staying, you know, in, in digs and stuff. And I was actually happy when I, I was told that they weren't going to offer me a, a, an apprenticeship as it was in those days. I was quite relieved, to be honest. I bet you were uh, 1952, so you're in that age group. What other players were around at that time that you played against county or youth level? What was Ooh. the? Um, can you remember any of the players? Opposition, I can't really. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Got it, yeah, I can't really. I mean, there was some good. A lot of the lot of the te- uh, boys that played in the county team with me en- ended up having uh, good sort of semi-pro careers, sure. if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, good good non-league standard. Um, but off the top of my head, I can't... I might be doing somebody a disservice here, but I can't really remember anybody sort of going on and, and doing well professionally. Growing up, who were your heroes? Oh, my hero and still my hero, Don Rogers at Legend. Swindon. What a player. Best player. How he didn't play for England, well, he was a, he was playing in the second and third division with Swindon. That's why he didn't play for England. Mm. And then he went to Crystal Palace and showed what he could do in the first division. So, fantastic player. Let's just dwell on Don for a moment because scoring uh, goals at Wembley against Arsenal in the '69 League yep. Cup final on. You could only describe it a mud heap of a pitch, but he got <laughs> great balance and grace, could go either way. But he was a wonderful a, player. Got a stand named after him, haven't they, at Swindon? That's how great yeah, that fella yeah. is. Yeah, he's a legend. And I mean, it's 1969 when they won the League Cup, mm. also got promotion that year from yeah. the third division. That was the year I signed. What was so, he... 1969, I signed professional at the end of the season that they'd won promotion and won the League Cup. So those those lads in that dressing room were still my heroes. Let's have a name so that was strange. of some of the players that played for Swindon Town and won promotion and that cup. Yeah, I can tell you the, the winning team at Wembley for the League Cup. Go on. Downsborough, Thomas, Trollope, Butler, Burroughs, Harland... Uh, Heath, Smart, Smith, Noble, Rogers. Was that the that, great? That was. The, was that the great on. David Noble that went on to play for Burnley? No. Oh, okay. Peter Noble. Noble. Yeah, oh, Peter blimey. Noble went to Burnley. Okay, yeah. Sorry, uh, yes, Peter Noble. He got. Yeah. He, he was um, a bald-headed lad, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant player. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Uh, Don Rogers, Roger Smart, John Trollope, who's one of my heroes and and a legend. Uh, John played nearly a thousand games, I think, yes. and only one club. So mm. spent all of his life at Swindon as player and coach and assistant manager and manager and goodness knows what else. So all heroes of mine, Rod mm. Thomas, who went to Derby County with Dave Mackay and was a Welsh international, was a brilliant player when Derby won the league. Yeah. So there were some good players there. So what was it like, your upbringing there at Swindon, getting in amongst your heroes? How did it feel for a young David Moss? I was overawed. I bet you was. Honestly, I was was gobsmacked to be changing, uh, you know, sharing the same changing rooms and and the training field. I didn't get anywhere near the first team. Yeah. I was like uh, making up the numbers, basically, until... I had a stroke of luck and Dave Mackay, who, who was player coach at the time, became manager. And um, he, he, he must have seen something in me that, that he liked in training. And then he had me training with the first team and started involving me in, as a substitute. And that when I'd basically been nowhere near the first team. 
So that was that was a stroke of luck, really. You managed it before, Dave McCoy. How did you get on with that regime? Because Dave seemed <laughs> to really change your career path, didn't he? Yeah, Dave did. I did. I wouldn't have got anywhere with yeah. the previous. Yeah, you know, not being horrible, but mm. he didn't rate me. He did, I don't think he even liked the younger players, to yeah. be honest. Mm. Uh, none of the young boys got a chance. He was only interested in his fourteen or fifteen senior players. Yeah. So we just made the numbers up. I played for the reserves. I started scoring goals and, um, you know, doing what I had to do, basically. And um, Dave obviously saw something that he liked, and that was the beginning of it, really, for me. Rolling on 50 years, we don't have reserve team football, but that was or must have been so instrumental in your development, playing against seasoned pros that maybe have injured and were coming back to fitness and playing in those reserve team games. That was a great learning curve yeah. for me. Well, any young player, because you, you played on a Saturday or a Tuesday. Uh, when your first team was away, you played on the main pitch yeah. and main stadium. So I was at 17 playing in the reserves, and we were playing at White Hart Lane in Highbury and, and West, um, West Ham, you know, um, uh, Birmingham City. Right. They were in the football combination at the time. Cardiff yes, we City, uh, Chelsea... So it was it was great experience, Crystal Palace. You know, you're playing at all the first team gr- uh, grounds, so it was lovely. Because there was two leagues, wasn't there? There was the football combination that you've just alluded to. My team, Birmingham City, were in that, and then Aston Villa were in the uh, the Central the, League, wasn't they? Yeah, that was it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Central. There was a yeah Central League. That's right. Yeah, which in- included the Manchester clubs and yeah. So. I think Birmingham are just slightly south of the border, allegedly. I think what happens, it's making up the numbers, isn't it? So you kind of, yeah. if you're in the Midlands, you can either be in one or the other, I suppose. Like, you know, yeah. that they have north and south. In the middle, you can be in either, depending on what numbers that you've got of northern teams or southern teams. What was your greatest memory from reserve team football? And what was your greatest thing that you picked up from plying your trade on those pitches with those players? Um, I think learning to cope with the physicality of it, the verbals from, you know, good old seasoned pros who were maybe coming to the end of their careers and threatening to break your leg if you went past them. And Was that Tommy Smith? <laughs> people, <laughs> I wouldn't say it was Tommy, but people <laughs> like that, you know? Yes would say, you you go past me once, I'll give you that one, son, but you do it again and I'll snap you in half. So that was the sort of thing you had to put up with. It was an eye-opener for, you know, I, I played for Whitney Town. I came from Whitney, which is a small town in Oxfordshire, and it opened my eyes to things, really. But, yeah, I think I think the, the reserve football was real football, where, whereas nowadays I have my doubts that it actually – Mm. prepares young players for first team football. No, I absolutely agree with you. You you learn so much by playing against those seasoned pros because that they'd all give it you and as a young and you must look at that and listen to them and think, geez. Yeah. What's going on here? I'm... You had to listen. Yeah, you did, yeah. I mean, are they being serious? Will he break me back if I go round the back of him again? But you're thinking, well perhaps I'm not gonna try that because <laughs> he may, he may be serious. I, I was a bit of a gambler. I had to. Tr- I had to keep yeah. trying. But you know, at the end of the game, these people would come up and and say, "Well done, son," and yeah. shake your hand and, and pat you on the head. You know, things like that. Mm. So it's just in the in the game, and, and their I suppose their competitive spirit comes through, and yeah. uh, their attitude, and that they you know they probably thought we're coming to the end of our careers, and you got these young whippersnappers trying to take the Mickey out of us, basically. Which we weren't really. We were just doing what we were sort of taught to do. It was literally but, a welcome to the professional game. Son. Professional football. Yes, yeah. it was. Definitely. But I mean, some of the ones that weren't in the first team, say they were left out of the team or coming back from injury. Yeah. So the likes of um, some of the Swindon boys who were my heroes were playing also in the reserves when they yeah. were not selected or because they only ever took 12 players away with them. So there was three or four from that squad that would stay and play in the reserves. And it was great. You learned from those as well. Wonderful experience. 
because again in those days we didn't have the subs that we have today the three no. or the five subs it was like one substitute that's <laughs> it before 1966 no substitute no subs that's right Completely. goalkeepers moving up front and when they got injured and somebody else going in goal yeah i remember it well you remember that liverpool game well you had three goalkeepers that day didn't we, you we did yeah yeah that must have been an extraordinary situation and Kirk Stevens, the snooker player, it wasn't him, was it? It was Kirk Stevens that played for Luton Town that went in goal. Kirk, yeah, he was um, he was from Nuneaton, actually, Kirk. Oh, OK. He played for Nuneaton, and that's where David Pleat, who used to be manager of Nuneaton, right. many years ago, and he knew Kirk from then, and he signed him for, I don't know, £10 or something ridiculous. Yeah. Whatever it was, it was a bargain. He did fantastic at Luton. So that... Kirk went in goal. Jake Finley was the goalkeeper. He was also from Villa. Yes, he was, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Jake got injured and did his ribs or something. And Kirk went in. And then Mal Donaghy went in in the second half. And we still managed to get a point. Quite incredible. And got clapped off as well, didn't you, by the Ambulance? Yeah, they were good. The, 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 yeah, the, the cop and everything were fantastic. I think they appreciate good football, you know. Again, they were brought up with good football and I think football fans in those days were more appreciative of the opposition and would give you a round of applause rather than hurl abuse at you these days. Who was the the player or players or teams that um, gave you the most difficult games, David? I think when you played the likes of... When we got promotion from the second division... Um, we were a good team, but I think when we got into the first division, it, it hit us really that this is a different level. So when you played the, you know, Arsenal and Man United and uh, Liverpool and Everton, they were too strong for us. But we had to learn quickly. Yeah. And we had a manager who could see this and he strengthened the team with three wonderful signings, which Peter Nicholas, Mick Harford, and Steve Foster, the heart of the team, the spine of the team, and that kept us up, basically. Because we were getting bullied. We were getting bullied by, you know, good players and top teams. And we would have gone down without those lads. Three hard players as well. Very top hard, players, weren't they? Yeah, a bit of experience as well. Yeah. But all good players. They could all play. Who gave you your most difficult game? Or what team did you... I wouldn't say fear playing against, but what team did you play against and you thought, you know what, it's always a difficult game, this one, are you? <sighs> Most games i played, <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> especially in the first division. <laughs> yeah. I think um, the p- people that were tough to play against were the likes of John Gidman. Yeah, Giddy's great. Um, right, right back. And Gary Stevens at Everton. Yes. Because they they were quick and yeah. they wanted they wanted to attack all the time. Yeah. You know, they wanted to go on the overlap and it was, oh my God, this is a bloody nuisance. They used yeah. to run past me and I'd get a rollicking because he's run past me. And t- players like that gave me more problems than the ones that were just, re- you know, just defenders, basically. Yeah. The ones that wanted to keep bombing on and and attacking and annoying me. <laughs> and, and I... But you stepped up a level, you see, when you played against those teams in the first division. There were some good players in League Two, but when you stepped up, it, it was noticeable. Your most um, luckiest and unluckiest ground that you played at? Oh, luckiest? Mm. Oh, that's a good shout. Mm. I'm trying to think where, where I scored goals away from home. Uh, well, one of my favourites, obviously, is Anfield. Yeah. It's the only time in my whole career that I got a round of applause for scoring a goal at, at an away ground, mm. and that was the cop. It was a great goal, and it was an well, it was a good goal. Place. It was in front of the cop, okay. and I it was a fantastic um, response that I got. I couldn't believe it. I thought yeah. thought somebody had you know been substituted, and they were clapping somebody mm. coming on. I, I, honestly, I was amazed, and that's the only time it happened to me in five hundred odd games. But when you look back at that game and that goal in particular, it was a fantastic goal, wasn't it? Yeah, it gives me a lot of pre- a lot of pleasure. And that pass, probably phenomenal. Probably um, 
I wouldn't say it's the best goal I've ever scored, but it would be up in the you know the top five. What would be the best goal that you scored? I think I, uh, I scored one against Sunderland, which was similar to that in in as much that I had chipped it over the goalkeeper, but it was a little bit more. I had two or three defenders in in front of me, yeah. so I had to sort of ma- manipulate the ball a little bit and just move it half a yard to give myself a little bit of room to clip it over, and it it went it sailed over the goalkeeper into the top far corner. So I think that would probably be up there with my best. Is that why you? Got... I must just tell you one more. Yeah, go on. I scored a similar goal to the one at Anfield with a chip over the goalkeeper at Preston North End. Yeah. And David Pleat said to me after the game, Tom Finney said, I really like your number 11. So I thought, that'll do for me. If you don't do anything then for the rest of your career, to have that from Sir Tom Finney, it's yeah. just different class, isn't it? That's what I thought. Yeah, that'll do for me for yeah. the rest of my life. What a player Tom yeah, Finney was. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Left wing, right wing, down the middle. Anywhere. Unbelievable player. Yeah. I think when you get a compliment like that from somebody, you you never forget. No, you certainly don't. Is that the reason that you got the nickname Chip? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, possibly. Yeah. There was also another reason that um, it was Brian, Brian Horton, nicknamed me Chip. He, he, he always thought I had a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> so he called me Chippy. And I, I told everybody it was because I kept trying to chip goalkeepers. So it was, a, it was a bit of both, I think. He was some player, wasn't he, Brian Horton, and a bit of a nemesis of yours as well before he signed for Luton, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. We didn't, well, I didn't think we would get on, but mm. we're best mates. We're still best mates to this day. So we meet up and I speak to him every week, Brian. Um, but we didn't, when he was at Brighton and I was at Swindon, there was a bit of rivalry for between the two clubs because Brighton were always seen as the the big spenders at the time, to be honest, in in the third division, paying big money and good bonuses and getting promotion and stuff. And I think we always upped our game against them and there was a bit of needle there, you know. So Brian was another one who used to give me a bit of verbal, try and kick me, and then we were best of mates off the field, though. It is quite incredible. I mean, that leads me to when I remembered Steve Perryman talking about Alan Ball in the players' lounge. Ball, he says to Perryman the one day, you don't like me, do you? And he said, no, not really, Alan. He said, you would if you played with me. Yeah. And I think that's the thing with players. When you're playing against them, you might not like them. But when you play with them, you love them. Exactly. I mean, Brian came to... I was in America when Brian signed for Luton. And David Pleat rang me because I knew I was going back to Luton after I'd finished the season in Tampa. Yeah. And David said, um, I've signed a new captain for this season. I said, oh, who's that? No, Brian Horton from Brighton. I went, oh, dear, we don't get on. <laughs> he said, really? I said, so I told him the story that I've just told you. And uh, he said, you'll be fine. And, yeah, we when, when I went in to train for the first time after I got back from America, Brian was there and we – Shook hands, had a chat, and we've been mates ever since. Fantastic. He gave me my first coaching job in football. And I stayed with him for over 20 years as coach and assistant. So we're good mates, great mates. What was Pleaty like as a manager? He always come across as a really terrific guy and produced a great team at Luton Town. He, He was an excellent coach. Yeah. Excellent coach. And David was all geared for entertaining football yeah he wanted us to entertain he wanted us to we never sat back and tried to try to draw or try to win a game one nil and then shut up shop we weren't capable of doing that mm. so if we went one up or two up we went for three and three and four you know and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't we had some games i mean five three seven one four four we had some fantastic games so he, he was he was a good, great coach, David, and a, good, a, a thinker really about football. Yes, he was. Yeah. He's always thinking and tinkering and trying to make us better than that. But it it was great times. He had a great media presence as well, didn't he, David? Please. Yeah, very good, very intelligent. Mm-hmm. He's, a, he's he's a deep thinker about football. 
and um, he was very passionate about it. It may not have come across in his personality as, you know, he wasn't as loud and vociferous as some of the managers and coaches, but he was he was very passionate about Luton Town. I think when you're intelligent, you don't have to do all that. Because yep. he just he thought the game through, didn't he? And um, he put his ideas across to the media as us fans were watching match of the day. And I'm guessing he was similar in the dressing room and on the training pitch, putting his ideas across to you players. Yeah, he was. He was never ranting and raving, and mm. he was, um, you know, pretty calm about every situation. Really, I mean, we got. We got, like I said, when we first went up to the first division, we got some heavy defeats, and he would go, you know, right, we can, we know we can do better, but we move on. He was not, he wasn't one to dwell on things and yeah. worry about losing. You know, we've got next week, next week we, we'll start again on Monday and we'll get cracking and we'll prepare for the next game. And that's what he did. He didn't dwell on things. I think he realised that going up in class into the first division, we were going to have some tough days. He always struck me as a manager that would focus on what you could do rather than some managers criticise you for what you can't do. Well, that sums me up exactly. I was lucky enough to, to play for a manager who did say that to me. Yeah. I know what you can do, I know what you can't do, but I've signed you for what you can do Absolutely. and what you can bring to the club and what you can bring to the team. Yeah. And that was it, really. That's how he sold it to me. I know your weaknesses, but I don't dwell on it. But I know your strengths, and I know your strengths out, outweigh your weaknesses. So he was good like that, David, and it makes all different sort. It makes all sorts. What did you used to say? It makes all types to make a team. Absolutely, and then managers knew how to cajole a performance out of a player. The ones to put their arms round, the ones to give a kick up the backside. Proper yep. old school management. If you could replay one game from your career, what game would it be and why? Oh, I think it would have to be my debut for Luton. Yeah. Because we were 1 0 down at half time and not doing too great. Um, and David calmly reminded us because I think there were seven new players in the team that day out of the 11. So it was a, it was a new team. Yeah. And he just calmly reminded us of why he'd signed us all. In that 15 minutes, half-time, he got his point over because we won 6-1. <laughs> and we were 1-0 down at half-time. Who was that against? It was Oldham, and they were a decent team. Yeah. They were a good team back then with some good, experienced players. Um, but we just scored a goal, and we scored it and went 2-1 up, and then we just didn't stop. We just attacked and attacked and basically wore them wore them down so so much that we, if the whistle hadn't have gone, we would have probably got double figures. Wow. Um, but it was great to play in, you know, because it was my yeah, first was. game um, since I signed from Swindon. And obviously, like I said, all the other boys were new to the, to the club as well. So it was a great day. And was it a home debut? Was it at Kenilworth Road? Yes, it was a home yeah. game, yeah. What was that place like to play? Fantastic um, atmosphere. Yeah. If you had ten thousand or twelve thousand people in there, I mean, it was it was equivalent of fifty thousand in other stadiums. Yeah. It was rocking, and it was you know it was lovely. The pitch wasn't the best, <clears throat> but we learned to play football on it. We didn't, you know, we we were a passing team. We got we got good skillful players that had to play and had to pass the ball. But yeah, it was a great place to play. I'm looking at your stats. I've never been one for stats, really. I'd like to look at a player and, and see what I, I see through my eyes. But uh, looking through your stats in all competitions, for Luton Town, 245 games, 94 goals. For Swindon, 261, 82. So very, very similar. For a wide player, them figures are phenomenal. And that doesn't include assists. Your assists must have been probably twice as many as your goals. So what I'm saying is, David Moss was in every game that he played, either assisting or scoring a goal. That's phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, yeah, to be honest, I wasn't much into stats. But since, no. since I've retired, no. people have thrown sort of figures at me. So it, it looks OK. But I would love to have had our assists count in back in the day. Yeah. Because... Oh, like you say, I would have my numbers would have been right up. So 
but it wasn't to be, was it? And I think with VAR, I probably got another 20 or 30 in penalties yeah, for some of the goals, some of the penalties that were turned down and some of the goals I had disallowed for offside. And to listen to the rest of this podcast, head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash SRB Media. Thank you.